Um, yes, I definitely like to praise the Lord for my salvation and everything he's been doing in my life recently. Um, just a couple months back, I took a job with a new company that I was really excited about, and the job ended up going um, south, and things weren't working out as planned, and they weren't giving me the hours that I wanted. So I prayed about it, and I sent an email to my company, and they responded with they wanted to see me in person. And I had some prayer about the meeting going into it. And then when I got into the meeting, it just went very, very badly. And they said that I wasn't communicating properly and that it was all my fault. I wasn't getting the shifts I wanted, which um, I went back home and I went through all my emails and I knew that wasn't true. So I just had some prayer about it and I really wanted to find a new job because I needed more hours. And for a couple months, I was getting a bit discouraged because I just had to stick with this company and um, I wasn't getting enough hours and I couldn't find another job and I started to get very discouraged. And then there's a talk given, I think, two months back about discouragement, about being discouraged, and that was a real uplift. And sure enough, the Lord provides in his perfect timing and I got a new job and there's a possibility for me getting a second job as well, which would be an amazing blessing. And I know that's all of the Lord. Um, and also just another quick blessing with um, Eli getting here soon. Um, there is a big, big provision from the Lord with his flights. Um, so we looked at his flights and originally it looked like it was going to cost $3,000, which was way out of our budget. And so we just both went and prayed about it. And the next time we looked at flights, they had dropped down to $1,500, which is a crazy, crazy decrease. And um, we know that was of the Lord, but um, Eli neglected to tell me that he accidentally selected the wrong dates. And um, he didn't tell me this until it had been resolved, but uh, he had selected dates so that he'd only be here for two weeks instead of four. And he had some prayer about it and called the airline and they said it was going to be another $300 to change the um, dates of the ticket. And so he prayed about it again and called up and they said, look, just this one time, we'll let you have it for free, which is really unexpected for airlines. They're pretty strict with that. And so, yeah, I just know that the Lord is looking after me in my life. And yeah, I just praise him for everything he's doing. Yeah, I can definitely praise the Lord for my salvation. Um, just something that abruptly happened yesterday during Young People's. Um, my mom ended up calling and she knows that we have youngies every Saturday and what time. So it was kind of strange that she called. Um, but Josh was chairing and he had his watch on and ended up going through his watch. And so then I saw that I had a missed call. Um, anyway, I just ended up um, calling her back and uh, I knew she was going to Alouette Lake uh, for a paddleboard um, and it was super disconnected because there's no reception up there and all I could hear was like her saying I need help and then her saying the car and I was like oh my goodness she got into an accident <laughs> um, but she didn't. The lesser of things happened where she just locked herself out of the car and um, we just had to pick up and kind of leave young people's and go and get the spare key and pick her up and resolve that situation. But I was just thinking about how much of a blessing it was that nothing else um, drastic happened that, you know, I don't know um, this happened all the time. It's life life happens and um just that it's was so much of the lesser of things um that she was safe and that it wasn't even dark when we got up there and it was already 9 30 at that point so I was figuring that it would be pretty dark and there would be no one around but everyone was still kind of heading off and um she was just so peaceful and um, calm about the situation. And I kind of reflected on myself as well, thinking, well, in that situation, I would probably be really stressed out. Um, but I have the Lord and that's not an excuse. I need to, I need to be built up enough to where things like that happen, where it's just life. Um, I can be that peaceful and just praise the Lord that everything went smoothly and amen.
Um, yes, I can certainly praise the Lord for my salvation. Um, just a couple things to thank the Lord for regarding my life recently. Um, there was some things going on at my job, kind of similar to Paige, um, where I needed more work and I was kind of discouraged into looking because um, I had tried and wasn't getting anywhere. But um, I just kind of had a thought to myself, you know, like you're limiting the Lord's ability for you. And um, after thinking that way, I ended up getting three job offers um, and I was kind of laughing at myself thinking, you know, that's the Lord saying, oh, you think I can't do anything? Watch me. And so I was kind of um, taken back by that. But um, the job, the first job offer I got, they don't need me yet. So I was kind of like, oh, I need work now. And then I ended up getting the second job offer. And um, I met with this woman and she's hired me to do some cleaning for her. And um, she offered me a specific pay. And I was like, wow, that's that's awesome. That's that's amazing. Praise the Lord. And then I got to um, my first shift and she looked at me and she's like, I'm actually going to pay you this instead. And she, without me even doing anything, already gave me a pay raise. So I was like, wow, that's incredible. And then she gave me some supplies that I need for free. And she was saying to me like, oh, it's such a shame you're moving to California, because if you weren't, I would make you a shareholder and give you, um, like, have you be my business partner, because she just likes my qualifications. And I was like, whoa. So um, her and I have potential to go in that direction um, at some point, which would be amazing. And I know that's of the Lord. And then also, I was just kind of stressing out um, regarding wedding stuff, because I, I don't know, I just kind of got overwhelmed. So I hadn't done anything. And then Nathan and I had planned to try and get married for spring next year, and I put zero effort into anything and um, just said to the Lord, I'm not going to do anything except go to this one place, and I want you to bless the situation. And so I went to one place to look into a bunch of stuff we needed to do, and everything we needed done was done that day. And I just thought, praise the Lord, now I don't have to think about anything else for now. And, you know, the Lord just really had his hand on those situations, and I just praise the Lord for that. Hello, um, Oliver from Geelong Revival Fellowship back in back in Geelong. I'm um, good to see everyone again. Um, I love to pray the Lord for my salvation. Uh, I'll start with my salvation testimony, how I received. Um, um, good to see you. <laughs> um, I was nine years old when I started praying for um, for the Holy Spirit, and at the time, I you know my friends were getting getting started speaking in tongues and, and getting baptized. And so I wanted for myself. And so I was praying for the wrong reason. So it took me a little bit of time. But after a little while, um, you know, I realized what I had to do, what what it, what it was for, the importance of the Holy Spirit, what could it do for me. And sure enough, when I was 10 years old, I was praying at a camp. And, you know, I felt my tongue change. And I looked up at the elder that was praying with me. And, you know, he gave me a, like, a, we both knew, like, I didn't really even need him to say, I knew for myself. Um, but yeah, and then, and then I, I got baptized. Um, and from then I, I knew I had the Holy Spirit. And um, since then, just a, just a thought that was born out of a bit, bit more, but had a couple of things happen um, this year. I can only remember one now, but I'll try and remember the other one as I go. But just this year, uh, last year, actually, the end of last year, something happened at, at work and um, stressed me out to the point where, like, I was losing a bit of sleep over it and I was struggling a bit. And I had to, like, like I, I felt like this is the most ex stress I've ever experienced in my life. And so I had to, I had to, create like a, a, a good sleeping routine, go for walks, not touch my phone before bed, all those kind of things because I just couldn't sleep. And I'd, I'd like try and go to sleep, close my eyes. And then in the middle of the night, I'd just be thinking about this thing because it was just consuming me. And and so I'd get up and I'd write in my notes all these different strategies that I was coming up with on how to deal with this issue because I didn't know how to deal with it. And 
short story, long story short, I got to the point where, you know, it came time to deal with it and I was able to deal with it. And it was the easiest thing that I had to deal with. I, I, I spent so much time stressing about it when I didn't need to. Um, and basically before that happened, before I was able to fix that thing, um, I was just at work and I was doing a pretty mindless job. And so I just put my earphones in, listen to a talk, but then I was like, oh, I'm just going to, I'm just going to listen to the Bible as an audio book. And so I just went through Hebrews and there was a scripture that said that, um, that, uh, we, that we will become his people. He'll become a God to us and we'll become a people to him. Um, and I just, it was just like a penny drop moment for me where I was like, oh, what am I doing? I'm stressing. And I just, from that moment, I didn't have to worry about it. And sure enough, as I mentioned, came around to that thing where I didn't have to, I just walked in there and it pretty much resolved itself. Um, I'm just trying to think of that other thing that I was going to mention. That's all right. I'll tell you if I talk to you, if I think of it. But um, yeah, it's good to see you again. And I'm looking forward to camp and all the blessings that I'm sure we'll all be able to reap. Yeah. Absolutely. Praise the Lord for the testimonies that have flowed forth, the abundance of the Lord's power and glory in our lives, and uh, much more to come. Praise the Lord for that. I'll hand over to Pastor for the Word. Thanks, Brother Aiden. Um, not quite. I've got a chorus I want to sing. All right. All the musicians are getting ready. They're taking their seats. Let's turn to Isaiah 48, please. Book of Isaiah and 48. There's another chorus we might sing later on that is completely in line uh, with what I want to talk about, and you probably know it. Um, to get a touch from the Lord is so real. To get a touch from the Lord is so real. If you draw nigh to him, he will draw nigh to you. To get a touch from the Lord is so real. That's what I want to talk about today. Um, and sometimes to be able to get a, that that touch, as we understand it, um, and draw nigh to the Lord, we need our hearts to be still and just be reminded of the things of the Lord. And that's an incredible opportunity that we all have before us with camp coming up. And and that's a particular encouragement that I have for everyone. Enjoy the surroundings, enjoy the cooked meals and the fellowship, enjoy the walks and the swims in the in the lake. But whatever you do, make the most of the opportunity to draw near to the Lord because it's a little bit of a unique opportunity. Of course, we can draw near to God and get a touch from the Lord at any time, not saying we can't. And of course, it encourages us all to do that. We, we pray during the week, we have our meetings, and, and we, we look to keep close to the Lord. But camp is, in particular, a special time where if we avail ourselves of the opportunity, we could really get a touch from the Lord that is so real. And, and I want that for everyone, and I want that for me. And, and I'm referring to those particular times of special blessing that the Lord gives to us here and there as we just get in close with him. Avail yourself of that opportunity at camp, and you'll come away from camp um, lifted up and rejoicing because all those other aspects of camp that I mentioned will be a bonus and and they'll go to reinforce the the fact that we're the lord's people he cares for us he loves us and he's there to guide and direct us and and so i, I thought to go through some scriptures um just to encourage everyone to to have an expectation that as you draw near to the lord um that the lord will tap give you that touch of his spirit and in your heart something i believe we all need right i'm using a different bible today i i grabbed my bible bag and headed off out the door but my bible wasn't in it so i'm i'm not challenged by my masculinity the bible i'm using has got a flower on it and i'm wearing a teal tie but um we're going to press through anyway <laughs> right isaiah 48 and verse 6 
16, verse 16, sorry, Isaiah 48 and verse 16. Behold, no, what have I done? That's 49. There it is. Verse 16, come near unto me, hear you this. Here's an invitation from the Lord to approach. That's an incredible invitation that the Lord would give to his people. And you, no matter what you've been through, no matter what your, your current challenges in life are, this is the Lord's plea to you. He says to you, and take this personally, come near to me and hear you this. That's a very important aspect of being able to hear what the Lord wants you to. He's not going to yell at you from across the room necessarily. He's going to invite you to sit at his feet as he's done. And he's going to say to you, now listen up. And, and, and this is our relationship with the Lord. It's real. Come near unto me, hear you this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. For the time that it was, there am I. And now the Lord God and his spirit has sent me. Verse 17, thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord thy God, which teacheth thee to profit, which leadeth thee by the way that thou shouldest go. The Lord's ways by his Spirit are not necessarily all that popular with our mind and our flesh. But if we'll draw nigh, if we'll come before the Lord and sit at his feet, he'll teach us to profit. And that is a promise of the Lord's blessing poured out in our life as we follow his ways, as he leads us in the way that thou shouldest go. And I love that term. Because only the Lord knows the right way for us all. And he's called us to sit and come close, to listen up and to guide us. And that's what he does. Sadly, the vast majority, whether it was the nation of Israel, as Isaiah was dealing with here, or mankind, God's creation in general, has been a, I think it's fair to say, a disappointment to God. Because despite this gracious invitation, the majority of people have not availed themselves or, or at least continued to avail themselves of this opportunity, and Israel certainly did not. Verse 18, Oh, that thou hadst hearkened to my commandments. Then had thy peace been as a river and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. This is the prophet that it's talking about, teacheth thee to profit, where the fruits of the Spirit aren't just a list given to us in the book of Ephesians or Galatians, but a reality in our lives that we rejoice in, love, joy, peace, long-suffering. You can list them off. You can know them in your mind. But then to have them abounding in your life like a, like a, a well and a spring that comes up from within, that is the result of walking closely with the Lord and being in touch with the Lord and, and having the Lord give us that blessing of his anointing upon us as we walk with him. Oh, that thou hadst hearkened to my commandments. And the problem here is Israel, generally speaking, had not. Verse 19, thy seed also had been as the sand and the offspring of thy bowels like the gravel thereof. This is the abundance of the fullness of the promise that Israel robbed themselves of because they didn't do what God asked them to do. Just draw near, come and listen. His name should not have been cut off nor destroyed from before me. And, and then it goes on. We'll leave that there. Let's go to the book of Hebrews, please, chapter 10. And so as I read through both the Old and the New Testament, I, I'm not sure it's reasonable. It's probably unreasonable to suggest that God gets frustrated, but I could understand if he did. 
because I read of a God who desperately wants to be close to his people and has gone to great extents to be close to his people. Sacrificed his son so that he can be close to his people. Married the nation of Israel in the Old Testament so he could be close to his people. And all the way out, stretched out his hand and called them, Come unto me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And he's made a way for that to be possible, and yet... Um, Sadly, for the majority of his creation, they've pushed back and said, whether it's verbally or in their actions, no thanks, no thanks. Now, I don't know if God gets frustrated, but I can imagine that is a fr that would be a frustrating thing. Hebrews chapter 22. Sorry, scratch that. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 22. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. To be able to draw near to God, there are certain conditions that need to be met in order for us to be able to get near him, to, to approach, to, to come close, to, to engage. There are conditions because God is righteous. He can't he, he he needs to, and he's mapped out a way for, for his creation to enjoy the righteousness of his son and through that draw near to him. God in his righteousness needs to continually be separated from sin. If God removed the barrier between himself and sin, he would no longer himself be righteous. And so he's made a way for us to approach, to get close, and to be near to him. And, and so what I'm trying to point out here is in my encouragement for all of us to let's draw close to God, particularly during camp. Let's call on the Lord for him to touch us. And, and don't have any preconceived ideas about how that might happen. It might happen just in the line of a hymn that's being sung. I've had this before and, you know, you're singing away and you're happy and all of a sudden, you know, you've got allergies in your eyes and you're sort of trying to stop them. Um, or, or, or something that a brother says in a talk and it just out of nowhere, there it is, all right? But for us to be able to draw near to God, the conditions, of course, is, is to receive that initial experience of being born again repenting of our sins, being baptized in full immersion of water, receiving the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues. But then as we keep our hearts soft, meek, and humble before God, we draw near to God with a sincerity of heart, and we do that having an assurance of faith that God accepts us, that God is there, that we're there by the invitation of the great King to sit at his feet, and it gives us a boldness to approach the throne, come closely to God, have our own minds and our hearts stilled. So rather than us demanding God listen to him, God listen to us, we instead listen to him. Sometimes that takes a minute. And sometimes throughout the busyness of <clears throat> the routines of work and life and everything else, um, it might not happen as frequently as it should. Camp's a great time to reset that. Great time to get us back on, on track, just closer to the Lord. And as an extension of that, closer to each other, which is also important. The unity of the fellowship that, that is so important to the general health of the assembly. Having our hearts sprinkled, it goes on there, from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. <clears throat> without wavering. So a true heart, a simple heart that's been washed by the waters of baptism, but also those flowing rivers of water of the Spirit. 
And, and that has a great effect on our hearts, on our minds, and it opens us up to be very receptive to, to as we draw closer to the Lord in that regard for him to touch us and confirm to us his will, his good pleasure, his direction, and the security that we have in him. James in chapter 4. James in chapter 4. Verse is quite familiar to us. I understand that. James in chapter 4 and verse 6. But he giveth more grace. There is never a limitation on how much grace the Lord will give. But there is a limitation on who can avail themselves of the Lord's grace. And I hope you understand the difference. It's not semantics. It's real. He gives more grace. There is always plenty of grace. But my experience and my observation in my walk in the Lord has been there comes a time where people are able by choices to not avail themselves of that grace. And that's a sad, sad thing. But he gives more grace. Let's focus on that. There's no limitation or shortages. Wherefore, he saith, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So people with a, a hard and a proud heart doesn't mean the grace isn't there, but it does mean that they're going to be resisted by God himself. What an exercise in futility it would be to pit ourselves in a manner that would have God resisting us. That's not what God wants. And he hasn't put it here to say, well, that's what I'm going to do. He's put it here so that we can understand if, if there seems to be a barrier that we just look to humble our heart before the Lord, humble our heart before our maker, sit at his feet, and then receive the grace that he's promised will abound. And that's what that verse is saying. All right, He gives more grace, but he resists the proud. He gives that grace to the humble. Verse 7, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Verse 8, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. It's amazing, though, I've known of ones here or there, and I'm not talking about anyone particularly here today at all, who have sort of sat at a distance and said, God, you come to me. Now, I'm not talking about someone that's called out to God and said, where are you? All the Lord answers them. You know, show me the way. But we don't sit afar from our God with a, an attitude, if you will, or a chip on our shoulder and, 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 and sit around questioning why he's not answered us. The onus here, as I read these verses, is it's my, it's my obligation to draw near to God. And then I can expect in faith he will likewise draw near to me. Now, that's been my experience. And if ever there's a time that I've sat back and I've honestly felt, you know what, I feel a little disconnected. It's never been the Lord's fault. And also it's never been anyone else's fault. And, and I'm reserved to say it in that way because the obvious conclusion to those statements is it's my fault. <laughs> That's the wrong way to see it. It's not necessarily about fault. It's about identifying where the restriction is. And if there is a restriction in this flowing of the grace of God, well, that restriction will be our flesh. It won't be anything else. And these scriptures are here for our benefit so that we can clearly and easily see that so that that restriction be removed. So the onus here, draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. 
Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. A heart that is humble and pure before the Lord, washed and cleansed, will not be double-minded. It'll have a singular vision to just be close to God. The journey of the Lord, knowing that that's where my blessing comes from, that's where the, the safety and salvation comes from. Sometimes when I'm double-minded, I think, well, why am I double-minded in this? And the scriptures give me direction to maybe just stop and consider my heart, which is what I'm advising all of us to regularly. Verse 9, be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. There are seasons in our life and there are times when situations occur where this occurs and difficulties that we find in our walk can either harden our hearts as we fight and push back or they can humble our hearts to rely more on the Lord and draw closer to the Lord knowing that he's our answer and will lead us through humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up and and often when I read this, I don't know if you've seen the, the funny little cartoons where someone's trying to pull themselves up by their own shoelaces, okay? Something that'll only end up in broken shoelaces and probably you're falling over backwards. You can't lift yourself up by your shoelaces. And And when we try and strive in matters to sort things out, we can head down the track of trying to lift ourselves up. And it's as futile as taking hold of your shoelaces and pulling on them as hard as you can, expecting that you're going to lift yourself up out of the ground. If we want to be lifted up, which is what I want for me and for all of us, just particularly in that special time of camp, this verse says, well, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. That's not in the sight of everyone else. We don't have to walk around in sackcloth and ashes anymore. Those days are done. This is just a, an attitude of heart that comes with a great promise. Because for the Lord to lift us up, that means he's in contact with us. If you pick something or someone up, you touch them. You, you take hold and you lift. And that's the promise the Lord's made here. So drawing nigh to God and receiving a touch from the Lord go hand in hand. And, and I want to lift everyone's expectation, particularly for camp, that this is what the Lord is there inviting us to do. And again, I'll make it clear, not only for camp, any time, any day, day or night, these offers and promises are here. We just have a particularly special time to avail ourselves of them. Matthew chapter 8, please. Matthew and chapter 8. I've recently been reading through the Sermon on the Mount. I've had a great blessing in it, spoken a little bit about it. But verse 8 is the follow-on, what occurred, what continued to occur after Jesus came down from the mount. Verse 1, when Jesus was come down from the mount, great multitudes followed, followed him. So when he was on the mount, he was preaching. And, and so there would have been a, a bit of most likely a distance between him and those that were listening to him as he was up in an elevated place given that great sermon. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Now, the significance of what happened here can be lost on us because leprosy is not a big deal since anymore. Since the invention of penicillin and modern drugs, um, leprosy for the most part has been eradicated, especially in the Western world. And no big deal. But back then, leprosy was highly contagious, as it is now, but back then there was no cure. And 
most likely fatal. And the sad thing about that leprosy is it didn't happen instantly. It didn't happen overnight. It took, in some cases, many years. And so leprosy, as we know, has been likened in the Bible as a type of sin and the effect that sin has on us as it, it starts in a small spot and just spreads throughout the body if it's allowed to do so. And so the last thing that anyone would have done back then was touch a leper. They had leper colonies to ensure that that contact was removed from society so that leprosy was contained in its spread. And the first rule was you don't touch a leper. So here's this man with leprosy coming to Jesus. And we hear of a, a dialogue that was one-on-one. -on -one. He must have come close to the Lord to be able to have this conversation. I can't imagine it was yelling from when he was on the mountain, right? This was a conversation. So instantly they're close. This leper has come to the Lord. He probably was a little bit standoffish, understanding that, you know, the, the cultural norms, that I don't want to spread this. But he approached Jesus with a request. And in that request was great humility. He didn't come demanding. He didn't come, you say you're this, then I want that. He just said, Lord, if thou wilt. There's a softness, there's a humility in this request which I'm sure the Lord appreciated. He said, if thou will, thou canst make me clean. And what I see in that statement is two things, humility, if thou will, and faith. It wasn't, do you think you can make me clean? It was a statement that you can make me clean. So this man had those two key ingredients, humility and faith. And I believe Jesus would have seen it before that man opened his mouth. Wouldn't it be nice if it was as insightful as Jesus? <laughs> We're not. Verse 3, and Jesus put forth his hand and touched him. In the context of what I explained with leprosy, that's significant. Saying, I will be there clean. Simple. But here's this contact. And, of course, there's a greater message that, was, that Jesus was getting across here. Jesus was going to take on him the leprosy of all mankind, sin upon himself, so that mankind could be cleansed of their sin, as has been the case for you and I. And that would come by the Lord coming in contact with us, us drawing near to him and him to us, and then contact being made. That contact in particular was made the day you were filled with the Holy Ghost and fire and you spoke in other tongues a miraculous language that the Lord gave you to confirm his, his word and plan and purpose for you in your life. I will be thou clean. He didn't need to say, go and dip in the River Jordan seven times. I was thinking about that. That was Naaman, right? They were both in the Old Testament. Naaman was given that instruction because God knew Naaman was proud and that he would struggle with that instruction as he did. Jesus knew this man was humble and had faith. He was close to him. And so not only was, was he physically close, when it came to the attitude of his heart and his mind, that's where he was closest to the Lord. Because we read about other people that interacted with the Lord and they might have been physically close and yet they were miles apart. Right? And I think of that young man that said to Jesus, what do I need to do to, to be perfect? And Jesus said, I'll sell all you have and, and give it to the poor and follow me. And that young man went away upset because he had great possessions. He might have been close, as close to the Lord as this leper was, but he was further away couldn't have been further away from the Lord in his heart and his attitude. And so the closeness that I speak of, that it's important for us all, is in our heart and our attitude as we come before the Lord. Because I know I've gone to the Lord before and I've <laughs> barked out my complaint and I've barked out my expectations and I've stopped and I've listened to myself and I've thought, you idiot, that's not how this works. Help help don't care how don't care if it's the ravens or whatever else right 
and immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Not over time, immediately. And again, that reinforces the truth of our perfect salvation. The day we got saved, the leprosy of our sin was immediately cleansed when we got a touch from the Lord. And we drew close to the Lord because we accepted by faith that Jesus was the Son of God. We we're obedient. We got into the waters of baptism. And so there was this great coming together, unity between us and the Lord. And that resulted in unity between us and the fellowship. And that's how it works. And quite frankly, that's the only way it works properly. And the onus on that is for all of us individually to engage. And, and I do encourage us to engage with one another. That's scriptural. But my encouragement today is engage with the Lord first. And then the engagement with one another, no problem. No problem. Matthew chapter 20, please. Matthew chapter 20. And verse 29, and as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by. It's lucky it didn't write when they saw that Jesus passed by. That would be a challenge in the translation. When they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. I thought that that's an interesting thing to say to acknowledge the genealogy, the accurate genealogy, that Jesus Christ was the son of David, who had the right to the throne of David. That's quite an amazing statement. But here was this request, that as Jesus passed them by, they just asked for the mercy of the Lord, and they acknowledged his royalty. Have mercy on us, thou son of David. Verse 31, and the multitude rebuked them because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more, saying, have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. I, I love that. The crowd's there. I'll be quiet. No. If you ever want to be rebellious, be rebellious in that way. That's a good rebellion. They cried out to the Lord, the more. Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will you that I should do unto you? So now they're back in this close proximity where they're now having a conversation. They cried out to the Lord, as we've all have done. Maybe they were at a bit of a distance, right? And, and they weren't sure how they should have approached the Lord, maybe, or maybe because of their blindness, they just couldn't get there. So they cried out. And the Lord heard their cry and most likely came to them. So follow the analogy through when it comes to us approaching the Lord. It's okay if we feel a little lost sometimes and we think, I'm just not sure what to do. Cry out to the Lord. Oh, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And you'll find the Lord will come to you. But if in rebellion we say, Lord, you need to come to me, <laughs> you know, that, that kind of attitude, well, we know it doesn't work that way. God resists the proud. So he asked them this question. Now they're close. They say unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. Now Jesus knew what their problem was, but he just wanted them to convey it. We, we want to see. They knew they were blind and they wanted the Lord to anoint their eyes. Now, none of us here, are, we, we all may have varying degrees of eyesight, but there are times in our walk with the Lord when things can become clouded a little if we've drifted away from the Lord or his word. If we've allowed the flesh to affect our vision, then we're blind. 
just as the Laodiceans were, Jesus challenged them on it. The answer for us to have a clear vision in this regard in all things is the same pattern of behavior that is being established here. Call on the Lord, draw near to the Lord, the Lord will draw near to you, and then he'll touch you. Verse 34, so Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. And immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. And, and I know there's been times where I've needed to call out to the Lord, Lord, I need a clear vision in this matter. I need to be able to follow you. And I, to do that, I need to be able to see. And to be able to see, I need you to anoint mine eyes reflective of us knowing, every one of us, that we are totally dependent on the Lord all the time, every day. And, and the longer we're saved, the more difficult it can be because we've got history where we've been through things and so we kind of know how things work. And we can start to rely on, oh, well, I know how this works and I know how that works and I know how this is going to go and I know how that's going to go. And without even knowing it, we can become blinded to what, where the Lord's trying to lead us because we've made our own mind up. The easier, better, clearer, simpler way is just to get the Lord to, be, to, to touch our eyes. And that requires a degree of great trust. I'm very reserved to let anyone come up to me and start playing around with my eyeballs. I'd advise you do the same. But the Lord is someone we can trust with every aspect of our vision, of our life, of our soul, of our heart. We've got to keep moving. Mark chapter 5. So the interaction that Jesus had with these sinners, by the way, was an interaction of drawing close, contact, healing. Now, the healings were manifest in a physical way with people that had ailments like leprosy and blindness, but they're also very representative of what Jesus came to do to heal us from our sin, which leprosy and blindness represent, right? His woman, we, we're well familiar, I'm sure, with the story in verse 25, a woman that had an issue of blood. This is Mark in chapter 5 and verse 25. And it says here, And a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. I don't know. I see a bit of a, a warning there that... Um, we want to put our trust in the Lord first. It doesn't mean we don't get seek aid and assistance from natural means, but we want to be careful. Verse 27, and she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. Now, there's a, there's a whole talk in the garment aspect of this interaction. Jesus's actual robe was quite unique. It was special. It's why the soldiers cast lots over it at his crucifixion. It was valuable. And of course, that garment that he wore is a type of the robes of righteousness that he would give, right? But here's this woman, verse 28, for she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And so here are these two same ingredients, more, three. She was humble. She didn't shirt front him and make some demands. She came up timidly, inconspicuously behind him in the crowd, just wanting to just touch his garment. She was humble. She was full. She, she believed in her heart that if she, she did this, she'd be healed. Two key ingredients. And she made contact with the Lord. She drew near to the Lord and had the opportunity to touch the Lord. And it would seem automatically 
as we read through this, virtue flowed out of Jesus because of her humility and her faith on a Jesus was aware that it happened, but it would seem it happened just automatically, subconsciously it just occurred by the spirit that was within Jesus Christ and she was healed. We understand that that seems to be the, the process that occurred here because of Jesus' reaction. Verse 29, and straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague and Jesus immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him. All right, so he didn't sort of turn around and, yes, you're healed. It just happened. Turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? His disciples said unto him, seest thou the multitude thronging thee? And thou sayest, who touched me? So their answer was, um, everyone. And it's most likely there were a lot of people that came in contact with this robe. But this woman's humility and her faith made her interaction with Jesus completely different to everyone else that even touched him at that time. That teaches us a lesson on how to receive that touch of the Lord in our soul by his spirit. Without humility and faith, that's unlikely. So if at the beginning of camp or preferably before we get there, we need to ask the Lord to help maybe humble our heart a little. Maybe if we need a little bit of building up in our most holy faith, that'll happen at camp too, but it can happen before then. I see they are two key ingredients in us drawing near to God and receiving a touch from the Lord that is so real as this woman did. Who touched me? And he looked around about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing that was what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. So that confirms in my mind the humility that this woman had in her heart. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith has made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. It's not complicated. It's not... You know, I know I've had times in my life when I've had victories from the Lord and I've come across other trials and I've thought, right, how did I get that healing last time? Or how did I get that overcoming last time? Well, you've got to go all the way back to the basics. Draw near to the Lord, humble yourself and believe. And in the Lord's time, in the Lord's time, not ours, the windows of heaven will be opened and the floodgates of the blessing of the Lord poured out in our lives, which is, of course, what we want for everybody. Um, I'm almost out of time. I've got a minute left. So we won't turn and look at Jude, um, Doubting Thomas. <laughs> All right, but Doubting Thomas wanted some physical interaction with, with Jesus before he would believe. We don't need physical interaction with Jesus. We've been filled with the Holy Ghost and power. There'll come the day when our faith in the Lord will result in physical interaction with Jesus when he returns. And that, the Lord said, is, is, is where the blessing is. 2 Corinthians 12, we'll actually finish here. It's a bit of an odd verse to finish on. I'll give you that. But we'll finish here anyway because this is about to start buzzing. Pause. I've got a couple of minutes. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. Paul the Apostle was mightily used by God. He had a lot of wisdom and knowledge revealed to him by the Spirit. And he says here, interestingly, in verse 7, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now, we probably all speculated a little what was his thorn in the flesh. Some think it was a physical ailment that, that bugged him. Um, I'll give you another alternate option for what that thorn might have been as we read through these verses. But whatever it was, it was a problem to him. He had a problem. 
But he realized that that problem may have existed there just to keep him humble, which is a key element in being able to draw near to God. And so he considered that if, if that thorn kept him humble, then maybe it was a good thing. And he wasn't being, he wasn't self-martyred. He wasn't bemoaning and whining and throwing a pity party. He just concluded there. But he also asked the Lord that, hey, can you get rid of this first eight? For this thing I besought thri the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. That was the answer he received from the Lord. And again, it to me, highlights the key ingredients of staying close to the Lord, having faith in the answers the Lord gives, trusting that he knows better than we do, that his grace is sufficient for us all. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul goes on then and says, most gladly, all right, that's key, not bemoaning himself, but most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. And so this thorn in the flesh that Paul had might have been infirmities, reproaches, necessities, persecutions, and distresses. It's likely that that, that was the thorn that he was referring to, really. That could include a physical ailment, of course, but who knows. But the point is, God wanted Paul to draw near to him in humility and for there, be to, for there to be that contact. And that's what kept Paul a faithful minister of the gospel. It wasn't his accumulated revelations and knowledge. It wasn't his mind. It wasn't his agility in the Old Testament law. It was his closeness to God through humility and faith. So that's the talk for today. I'm a couple minutes over.